So what I want to say is that usually I start a podcast and then I'm recording like an intro. Oh, mm -hmm. this is Tommy Outdoors and so on and so on. But today is a special edition, special episode. So I'm just going right into it. Okay. Suzanne, how are you? I'm great. Right. I'm almost always great. What do you mean almost always? Um, well, you know, I did fall down the stairs and break my shoulder two years ago. I wasn't great. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I'm... that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so this is episode, I think, 28. I think this, is, this, this I think this is the the advantage of recording this intro later because then I can move in an episode and you know yep. and not, like right now I'm committed. It's, 20, it's probably 28. Okay. Right. So the <laughs> listeners are saying it's like why it's 29 because something like but I think it's 28. Great. And this is Christmas special. Fantastic. So we so we're recording that obviously prior to Christmas, but mm -hmm. it's going to be right around the Christmas time. And I just I just want to enumerate how how great you you helped in development of the podcast, and this is why I have you here. Oh well, thanks. I'm glad to be able to help. Yes, yes. So so I actually I written down like a few things. So uh, so first of all, you were the what was the episode? Do you remember what was the episode? Wow. That, that we that we recorded. Gosh, I was thinking it was under twenty, wasn't it? Yes. I it mean, was, it was under it was under like 10. It was episode 7. 7. I almost said 6. Right. It was episode 7. It had been a lot seven. of that, a lost. Yes. <laughs> so you were, first of all, you were first person who I didn't know at the time. That's right. To record a podcast with The first me. time we met. Yes. Was it when was, you interviewed me last Yeah, time. it was the first time I met you. And it was like you were first, the, all the previous guests of the podcast was people I knew, like, you know, my buddies and whatever. And you were like... Wow, you know, first person, like a first a stranger. proper, first proper <laughs> guest on the podcast. Well, right? cool. Yeah. And so. now we're friends. Of course. And we bump into each other at all kinds of cool events, like yeah. this Sea Synergy yeah. weekend. That was pretty, that was pretty cool. Yep. I'll get, to, I'll get to that event. Okay. I'll get to that event because that, that counts as one of the things that you've done for the podcast. Right. But then there's another thing. Yeah, there's a there's a, if uh, if you if you hear anything, there's a guy pushing like a now trolley. the motorcycle decides to come by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always <laughs> like that, right? So then the other thing is like you took a selfie with me after yep. recording my podcast, and yep. that was a start of me taking photos for the cover of a podcast. Uh huh. So that was that's actually your idea. Well, I had, good. I had, I'm glad I was able to help. I, I had to. I had to give you that. So my you, marketing background. Yes, you send me that photo. <laughs> you send me that photo. Say, oh, it's a great idea. I didn't even know that there is a place for a, for the like a like a podcast a uh, uh, cover. Right? Nice. So I started taking those photos. And I ended up with a selfie stick. Well, then this stick. time I'll make sure I put lipstick on before right, I do it. Right, right. And I have a, and I now I now I have a selfie stick. Uh -huh. And I tell you a story behind that. Why yes. I have a selfie stick? That's so a, that's quite a selfie stick you've got. Yeah, yeah. It also acts as a tripod and uh -huh. it has like a Bluetooth thing, so you can remotely trigger photo and all that. But I was always forgetting to take a photo. <laughs> I even once interviewed. I not interviewed, but I recorded a podcast with a with a guy in Dublin. And uh, a fantastic podcast. I don't remember which number is it. Um, um, and uh, I forget to take a selfie with him, like a photo. And I almost drove all the way back to Dublin just to take a photo of him. <laughs> Luckily enough, I was recording another podcast. And I kind of could like, oh, can I nearby. Just, yeah, nearby. <laughs> and, and take that. So these are, these are two things. But then you get me in touch with... Lucy Hunt from C Synergy. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And although Lucy kind of never it never materialized for, to have her on the podcast, I have Ellie Turner from oh, C Synergy. Oh, Ellie, yes, right? fantastic. So I have that, that that episode. It's thanks to you again. Yep. Two and, marine biologists from Waterville. Yes, exactly. And then Ellie invited me on that event that you mentioned, uh, Ivora uh, Learning Learning Landscape, Landscapes. Exactly. Where I met more people. And I recorded podcast with Damian Foxel. I recorded podcast with Kira Nungent, who I met earlier at the shooting range, and we had the conversation. And then on that on that on that seminar, we kind of like looking at each other and like, like okay. I think I know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly this sort of thing. And it's like, have I met you at the club and the gun club? Yes. And so so, 
And this is a podcast that's going to be published after ours, this mm-hmm. one. And it's great. He, he, he has such a vast knowledge about the history of the forestry and, you know, how the political stuff was going on wow. and the 14th sure and the 16th hear century. That one. Yeah, that's an interesting Very one. Very interesting. Forestry you know, in it's, Ireland's an interesting topic. Yeah, yeah. And so, so that's... Uh, that's uh, um, going. And then next, next Sunday, this, this Sunday, actually, mm-hmm. I'm going to Waterville yep. to talk to Madeleine Weber. The photographer. A photographer. Right. And Aaron Turner. Yep. Right. Yep. So, so all that is on your on your account, right? That's, Fantastic. That's thanks well, for I'm you. glad. I'm glad to be able to help. Yeah, you help a lot. Have you been to Madeline's photography gallery? No, but it's I will be. Really beautiful. I will be in a few days. Good. Right. Is it? I is hope it's sunny. Right. Because it's such a wonderful drive when it's a sunny day. Yeah. Okay. So so all that. But having said that, we're missing an important guest here. So the plan was that today with us will be Donica Clifford, yep, who was uh, on um, on episode, I think three, mm-hmm. or maybe four. And even though you have such a vast, you know, amount of uh, kudos and help for the develop on the podcast, that Donica, who contacted me with you, and I never even met him. Yeah, really, no. Oh, I've met David. Tell us about his it. co-writer, but I've never met him. So tell us about it. How did that happen? Because well, uh, because my my segue was like like that. All that really is, <laughs> you know, Donica. Because he kind of, if you're listening to that, we're missing you here, buddy. You know, <laughs> exactly. We have a place here at where you support. But anyway, we, we I got him on the podcast again. Well, Donica and David have written a book on cycling and carry, which yes. is fantastic. And I've said fantastic way too many times right now, but it's a really great resource for anyone that's interested in cycling in the southwest of Ireland. And mm-hmm. we also follow each other on Twitter. Mm. And so one day I was here in Killarney and I was having a cup of coffee or something. And I tweeted a picture of the coffee cup when I was at Lear Cafe. Mm-hmm. And David sent me a message and said, are you in Killarney right now? And I said, I am. And he right. said, well, I'm cycling in Killarney. So... We met, and that's how I met David. And so I know David and Donica through their book, mm-hmm. even though I've not met Donica. And that's wow. how we got to sort I, of connect through I, social media. For I, all those people that think that's a terrible thing, you well, can I, connect through social media and no, have it you be can, good. You can. Okay, so that clarified something because I thought I thought that you know in my head like you know Donica for, for years. years and years <laughs> and like okay okay. Well, I've only lived here five, so I couldn't right. have known him that long. <laughs> right, right, right. That's great. You know. Um, so anyway, what do you think? Do you do you prefer like a podcast that goes straight into, or do you prefer like a, a little bit intro recorded earlier? I'm just going back to what I said earlier. Well, I think the intro sometimes sounds like a whole different tone of voice and mm-hmm. everything, so it sounds like it was yeah. recorded at a different time. I'm not even trying to hide that. Yeah, so I think I just think having it go right into it, right, and just kind of have a consistent beginning of every one, like yeah. maybe ask the same first question of every yeah. guest or something. That makes a consistency. I have at the to. Beginning. I have to go with your advice now, <laughs> right? Because I, I mean, you can argue with everything. Ah. <laughs> your background in marketing. Oh, that, that means if it doesn't work, I'm in trouble. No, no, it's, it's gonna be alright. I'm sure it's gonna work. It's gonna be easier editing. Yep. Right. So. Um, Especially time. You'll know exactly how long it is by looking at your little recorder. Yeah, right now. yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note of that. You know what other thing is happening? What I like with the discussion with you that somehow it's hard sometimes to get people relaxed. And we are like... You can always try cannabis oil. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Maybe. But then you, 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 can, you, you can't blame them, right? Because I'm doing everything to stress people. I'm putting microphones. Yeah, you've got big microphones put, and all the little wires around. Yes, and, exactly. And, uh, and what happens is like we start a discussion is like, it's very kind of tense and then people kind of relax and there's a little bit better and then we stop recording and then they relax mm-hmm. and they start talking like oh you know this like i was like damn why are we not recording that <laughs> it would be so much better like, i don't know maybe i need to try the yeah maybe just... just record right from the very start and no no they're, they're gonna be even more stressed <laughs> 
How do they know? You can hide that little red button but that's can't... glowing that you know means record. Yeah, but I can't hide the microphones. That's true. Right, they, they're gonna be. I don't know. I don't know. I need to. I was thinking that maybe if I'm gonna start like a conversation before recording and kind of, but I that no, that won't work either because they're gonna be kind of, you know, anxious in anticipation. Where it's I gonna... think you should just turn it on right from the beginning and eventually just sort of know in yeah. your mind that the first three minutes might not be usable because yeah. they sound too nervous. Yeah. No, it's it's okay. I'm just saying like once it's all done, they're kind of like, oh, it's and... over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, and we and we start like a conversation, and everything is like, Susan, you're starting a gallery. I am. Tell us about it. Tell us about it. Well, I have been planning this for a long time. As a matter of fact, I believe it's uh, 137 days after I was supposed to close on this building. I closed last week. So oh, I last have week. last week. Oh god. So I've bought a new house in Waterville. Mm -hmm. And I've been keeping my eye open for a house that I could use as a gallery. Mm. And this one when you walk in the front door, there's a bedroom door and then a really really long perfect wall. Wow. That's about 26 feet long, so that first wall is just going to be perfect for a gallery. Mm -hmm. And I've been into photography since 1976. Oh, my God, I'm dating myself right there. Bought my first really good Nikon in 1976 and have been taking photos forever. It's right. everyone in my family is into photography. My dad was into photography. And people can and, find you on Instagram, right? Right. Today in Ireland. Today in Ireland. Thanks. And my first two years that I lived here, I couldn't work. You know, I didn't have citizenship at the time. And, mm. and so... Since I couldn't work, all I did was travel around, take pictures, and share the beautiful things that I saw, mm -hmm. mostly in South Kerry, but really mm -hmm. all over Ireland, and kind of built up a little presence for people that like my pictures and got offers to take pictures for money. In my first two years, I said no, 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 because I just didn't want to take a risk that they'd turn down my passport <laughs> for working <laughs> illegally. And um, But now I can sell photos and mm -hmm. I have the gallery slowly outfitting. I've got some really gigantic canvases printed and some I saw, really like it's big... all on Instagram. I can, I can see, I can see. Wait till you see the really big one that I can't lift up. By it myself. doesn't fit in the frame, right? Because <laughs> Instagram has these square photos. And then exactly. <laughs> but I've got pictures. I mean, they're not all South Kerry because I blew up a huge picture of the cliffs at Ackle Island. Mm -hmm. Ackle Island in Mayo is one of my favorite places. Yep. And, uh, but I'm going to have a gallery and it's going to be mostly color, a little bit of black and white. I don't use Photoshop, not a fan mm -hmm. of digitally changing colors and things mm -hmm. like that. I grew up shooting film. Right. And uh, I just think that as someone who's really into the area and loves the area, loves showing how wonderful the Skellig Coast can be in mm -hmm. that area of the Wild Atlantic Way, I just want to share the pictures, share the beauty, and hmm. see if I can, you know, sell some pictures and make a little bit of money on the side as well. Yeah, so. I, I have the two things. Like Number one, do you think that shooting film, like you said, you have a 36 frames, mm -hmm. that that actually was promoting better quality of the pictures? You know, I think in a way it was. Because for one thing, there's something in photography called depth of field, mm -hmm. where like if I was taking a photograph of you right now and I wanted you clear, but th the building behind you in the distance that we can see mm -hmm. through the window, that would be all blurry so that you would be the center of focus. You used to be able to just change that with the camera yeah. only. And when it printed, it printed that way. But yeah. now I meet photographers that They'll take the picture no matter what it looks like, and then they go back into the computer and blur out the background. Okay. <laughs> now, okay. the bad part about that is when you did it in the camera, if you knew what you were doing, it took a second mm -hmm. to change yeah. what you need to do. On the computer, it takes you maybe 15 minutes. Well, that's, that's a waste a, of 15 minutes if that's you ask a, me. That's a, that's, a, that's a good point, but I think I wasn't clear what I was thinking. But, but it's it kind of, you already said that, only only a little bit different. That my thinking is, when you have thirty six frames, you really need to think about it. What you're gonna, what you're gonna photograph. So 
you 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 get out of the car, you look once, you look twice, you walk here, you walk there, and finally you decide like, yeah, that's a that's something worth one of my 36 right. frames. You climb up a hill to see if the view is better. Yeah, yeah. You lay well, down on the ground and see if it's better still. Yeah, and... well, now you can just go on and you go like, you know, 50 photos straight up and then you take and then 50, another 50 and you ended up with, with terabytes of photos. That's true. I mean, we do have that fallback of just a zillion pictures. But yeah. some of the some of the negative things about digital is that it's all run by batteries. You know, and back in the day when you had film in your camera, if your battery in the camera went dead for li your light meter or whatever, you could still take a photograph. Oh, yeah. Because they don't need a battery. Yeah. Film cameras don't need that battery. Yeah. And that's a big difference. So now, let's say you wanted to go climb through the McGillicuddy Reeks and spend four days camping. Is your battery going to last four days? You How got many these batteries? Little solar power yeah. things to charge your <laughs> That's power all bank. To <laughs> think about. That's exactly right. All those things you have to think about. But it's interesting. Yeah. I've taken lots and lots of classes over the years, and I've actually started teaching photography classes the last maybe seven or eight years. And one thing that's really interesting is a teacher that I had years ago, Janet Whitehead in Austin, Texas. She was really wonderful. She used to have assignments for each person in the class based on what they were good at or what they were bad at. Mm. And one of my assignments, I used to come from work and I'd be wearing was high she, heels. Was she giving assignments for what you bad at? Or did, did to she... make you better, you know, kind oh, of okay. seeing oh, what so you that was a, yeah. so, so she wasn't giving you assignments, something that you're good at to get the better results? No, you like was... if you were good at one thing, you never got to teach, shoot ah, that in class. Okay, okay, okay. But okay. like I used to come in in my high heels and business suit. I was a stockbroker mm. and used to be dressed to the nines, and I'd come uh -huh. into the class. It was at 6 p.m., so I'd zoom in and be wearing my high heels. And so one week, my assignment was every photograph that I took mm -hmm. for the assignment that week had to be laying on the ground. Right. Because she said, You're, most of the pictures are five foot eight off the ground. Mm -hmm. You're not like, you know, you're not moving around enough. So she said, every picture you have to lay on the ground. So I yeah. actually, one of my favorite pictures, I took a photograph of a waterfall uh -huh. in Zilker Park, Austin, Texas, laying on the ground, and there were shamrocks wow. on the ground that were only about four inches tall. Mm -hmm. And so I got the shamrocks at the bottom of the photo and mm -hmm. the waterfall in the distance. And wow. it actually looks like it could be Ireland. Right. But it's hot as heck, Austin, awesome. Texas. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So Great. she got me to think outside of the box. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, so, <coughs> so you agree. Yeah. That now, uh, you know, I probably said that story on the, on the, on the podcast already uh, at least twice, <coughs> but what the hell, I'm going to say a third time. Um, we were on a, on a business kind of business trip years ago in Italy. It was a three of us. And we Not had a bad place for a business trip. Yeah, I know. So uh, we were like, like hang out on a session once and then we just go out and, uh, and we had uh, three cameras and we had like a, everything is photographed three times because every one of us was taking photo of that thing. No, sorry. Let me get back. Was taking like 10 photos of the same thing. And then obviously give me all your photos. I give you. So we ended up with like a massive amount of photos. Probably none of us ever looked at all of them. And it was like majority of like, if you just remove the duplicates, you would have like a handful. And it was like, oh, is something wrong? <laughs> I'll tell you my trick. And I learned this from reading a photographer named Bob Christ from National Geographic. Mm -hmm. I learned so, so much from Bob Christ and his various photography books over the decades. And he used to say, separate the pictures into A, B, and C mm -hmm. when you're finished. Mm-hmm. A being mean, the yeah. good ones, B being the ones you think are good, and C being the ones that aren't really the best. Yeah. How do you how do you distinguish you just the ones that have good to look ones at from the ones that you think they're good ones? You just have to look at them and say, like, this one's good, or this one has a piece of string hanging in the front oh, of the face, okay. or whatever. And when you do the A, B, C, get rid of the C. Right. And then you take the A's and the B's and divide it into A, B, and C, mm -hmm. and get rid of the C. Mm -hmm. And then you narrow it down to the ones you can actually do something with. Right. Because when you do go out there on a weekend and shoot 400 pictures, yeah. you're just probably never going to use the 400. That wouldn't work that wouldn't work for me and my buddies. <laughs> I tell you why. Because we have a, even like a running joke that we're going to 
kind of review and sort all the pictures while we retired. Because because <laughs> there's so many of us. Like, you know, when the retirement comes, we're going to just review all of them. It's going to be all the memories. Well, that brings up a story that I, <laughs> I want to share. I was at a conference on war photography. That war was at photography. The Harry oh. Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And there was about six photographers that had gotten Pulitzer Prizes and more photography. It was a wonderful wow. conference. And at the conference was two women who were from the Harry Ransom Center Photography Department. Mm -hmm. And they were photo archivists. And they were printing something that morning that was a photograph taken like in 1916. Wow. But they had the negative and they had the ability to print it. So digital was sort of new at the time. Yeah. And I said, well, what do you think of digital? This must be just the best thing ever. And they kind of looked at each other with this crazy look. And I said, what's that look about? And they said, we get stuff donated to us all the time mm -hmm. from photographers and other famous people mm -hmm. when they die. And there's already obsolete software. So we get stuff donated that we cannot open. <laughs> yep. So if you wait until you retire, yep. by then... Everything's going to be like in some kind of a saving software system that we haven't even imagined yet. Yeah. So mm. print the pictures you want because that's really the I only have a, way you can I have save a solution. Them. I have a solution to that. Every now and then when there's a new technology, you're just taking all your terabytes of photos and you're putting it in the new media. Oh, yeah. You that's know? what you're going to do You have them on the time. CDs. Then, you're, then you put them on the DVDs. Then you put them on the, in the cloud. Then you put them on like... But look at even <laughs> CDs. They might not be readable in another two years because think of floppy disks. Right. When I was younger, they had giant floppy disks. Mm. Then they went to small floppy disks. Mm. Now they have CDs. So if someone gave you a floppy disk with fabulous... You know, no. fabulous photos. You wouldn't no. be able to you open didn't, it. You didn't maintain. You didn't maintain that. You need to maintain that and keep keep copying. I'd rather go for a bike ride around the ring. You need to copy. Keep copying. Keep copying. Do all that copying. <laughs> keep no copying thanks. the newer, newer media. <laughs> right, right. And what's your you you said that you don't you 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 don't like editing in a software or you no. or you like you don't you just flat I just out think don't. life is too short to sit in front of the computer. But then you can yeah well but then you can you can kind of you know pull to the front all the aspects of the image that you Well, want. I grew up learning that you took the picture in the camera no. that you really wanted to take. Right. So Old I school. think the people that, you know, kind of change the color tone of waves to make it look like the sun is setting behind and you can see through it. If it doesn't really look like that, yeah. it's pretty enough without I, the I hear you. Stuff. I hear you. But I like a, like a little, you know, like a equalizing the light and all that you I know just think... take out for the imperfection of the lens Ooh. just think about it if you had a better lens that cost as much as a house you know so you can have that effect on the computer well if that was the case i'd be i'd be living on my uh my island in fiji <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. i had a lens as much as a house <laughs> yeah yeah i had a friend and she was buying like a she 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 couldn't take a photo I don't think she will ever listen to that podcast. So I can say it. It was like the most ridiculous thing ever because she showed me a photo. I remember that that day. It was like the only time in my life when I look at the photo and I couldn't tell you what's on the photo. Yikes. I, I just couldn't tell you. Like, it's, it's like, but she had a good job and she had like a, the collection, the most expensive lenses and 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 cameras and all that stuff and like like wow well i'll tell you in 1976 in high school photography class the first thing that we did was everyone had to bring in a shoe box right and we made a camera out of a cardboard shoe box hmm. with a pinhole in the end put photo paper in the back and you would get, bring it outside open up the lens, let it sit for 40 minutes or so, wow. and take a photograph, and the photographs weren't terrible. Yeah. So that shows you that spending 5,000 euros on a really, really good camera doesn't matter. Yeah. As long as you know how to take a good photo, it can be a really, really cheap yeah. camera, and yeah. that's okay. And then also, you have to have something to photograph. Right. Something interesting. The same goes with the, with the filming. The filming is even if is even more exaggerating the problem that we said because people think that the that the film is like a photo, 
you're gonna take it like no you gotta you gotta re now you gotta sit down and edit the damn thing and even different to film and, and photo in general is black and white hmm. so black and white photography you know you look at a beautiful scene in Killarney National Park and take a photograph of that in black and white hmm. and do you really know what it's going to look like in black and white do you know what color that blue sky will be on film do you know what color mm. that green field sometimes the blue and the green end up being the exact same color mm. on the final picture so it's not really interesting so you you need to sort of learn you know can you put a red filter in front of it so the blue sky turns is it black? that an argument for computer uh you know no you still editing but if you know how to do it in the camera it's way quicker yeah but and then i, I can but like then i can have like a 20 of them like with a blue filter and green filter and red filter yeah. and black and white and sepia and whatever you can do that with red filters and blue filters right on the front that of the that wouldn't be quicker no. not that i'm advocating for using computer but i want to just try and point out that there are, are upsides yeah there are upsides if you know how to use it well it's interesting there was a photo contest and i i pretty much think it's national geographic mm. and they have a photo contest each year i think it's them where you can't digitally change the picture oh, other right. than cropping and like yeah, yeah. color brightening or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they narrowed it down to, I believe it was 20 finalists, they actually mm -hmm. had this in the front of one of the magazines, an article about it, a letter from the editor. And he said, everyone knew what the requirement is for the contest. And when they called those 20 people and narrowed it down, they said, send us the original file mm -hmm. to prove that you haven't edited it. Yeah. And something like six of the 20 couldn't because they had edited the picture <sighs> and the contest was for non-edited photos so i mean at some point <laughs> you got to wonder do, are we only seeing edited i mean people are taking mm. telephone lines mm. out people are like mm -hmm. even like P port mcgee if you look at port mcgee mm. it is a really cool little village great yeah. colors yeah you can take a picture across the water and it's absolutely beautiful i've seen pictures of port mcgee that are just outrageous colors And I look yeah. at that and I say, okay, that's not yeah, what I don't like Port those. McGee is. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> it's like already those. beautiful already. Why I are you making it look even crazier? I don't like Like those. a cartoon. But I do like, and, I, and, I, and I've done it a number of times, because removing the lines, like a, like a power lines from a photo, removing like a fishing rod that sticks in the corner of the photo, you know, removing a blood from the, from the fish on the, like a... <laughs> <laughs> like the old westerns with John Wayne. Someone gets shot and there's no blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, in, that's, in, that's interesting. It should be like a title of that episode. It should be photography. With... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about something else then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I actually... Um, so you talk, tell us about horse racing. I didn't know the last time ah. when we talked about it. You were a big fan of horse racing. We are. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, which is the home of the Preakness Stakes, the second mm. race in the Triple Crown in America. Right. And um, so we grew up close to the horse country. We'd cycle out when we were kids to the thoroughbred horse farms. I mean, huge farms. Mm. Nobody had gates on the farms in those days you'd mm. cycle right into the barns and you'd mm. pet the horses and talk to the people that work there now it's there's a lot more security right there was <laughs> these were the good farms. old times huh? yeah, the good old days yeah but yeah. um but yeah so we grew up i think i went to my first preakness when i was about 14 and just love horse racing love horses and horse racing and i know some people don't but i love horse racing and mm. my husband and i met uh gosh a little over five years ago and I was already flying back to the States when we met and, you know, he said, oh, you know, do you want to get together? And I said, well, no, because I'm actually flying back to the States in a week. Hmm. And he said, really, because I actually can get owners and trainers passes to this horse race <laughs> called the St. Ledger up at Doncaster in England. Right. And he said, if you came up to see me, we could go to that race. So I called a friend of mine who lived in England for a while <laughs> and I said, what do you think? And <laughs> Nancy and Nancy said, oh my gosh, that's the second best horse race of the year in England. Cancel your trip back and go to the horse race. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily for the first date as much as to go to that great horse race. Mm. And uh, But that was our first date, my husband and I. Right. And awesome. we now are season tickets here at Killarney Races and we're season tickets at Cork. We go to Punchestown. We go to, yeah. you know, the Curra. We go to Gorham Park. We, we really like horse racing. Right. 
And he's more you, into studying the betting odds and uh, trying to win and all that kind of stuff. Statistical analysis. That's it, statistical analysis. <laughs> and I'm more there just to take pictures, and I just really love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, I, you know, by, by looking at your photos on the Instagram, there are just... Great, great, and I'll tell like, you, nothing like you get beats in like, a, like an ambience and atmosphere. Like is the Killarney is the best place ever mm. to see a horse race. Right. I mean, it's unbelievable. You can see a golf course, yeah, a castle, mountains, and the horses. Right. All in the same shot. <laughs> it's really one of the more beautiful courses. Yeah. And are you riding horse yourself? Oh, uh, I rode when I was a kid a little bit. You know, right. things like that, but not. Right. I mean, right. I wouldn't fall off if you put me on one today, but I'm not really uh -huh. much of a okay. horsewoman. Okay, I had an I had an episode of a podcast with a um, lady from uh, Equestrian Center in Tralee. Ah, fantastic. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, we 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 talked about it. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, various breeds of horses and what's what's up going on. If you if you if you if you're listening, if you hear uh, some noises, it's because of people are just rolling into the to the room where we are. So that's all right. Um, it's our fans. Right, it's our fans. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna be waiting for autographs and stuff. <laughs> well, speaking of autographs, that's another thing at Killarney. You could get yeah. autographs of the jockeys and things like that. I mean, it's very laid back. It's mm. it's a really great spot for somebody yeah. that's interested in seeing what a horse race in Ireland's like. Yeah, yeah. I had a lady on the podcast who said that she was uh, working with horses for many years. All right, and uh, in 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 America on the ranch and doing all the stuff that you do with the horses on the ranch. Uh, so she knows the thing. And and then she stopped because one day she realized that this is all cruel and based on pain and uh, and she stopped it. Right. But you well, know, I, know, I know a lot of people feel that way <clears throat> about horse racing, but, you know, I'll is tell it you really? Is it really based on pain and suffering and all that? These these horses, you know, these seems people to be the, love these horses. Exactly. You know, when they make, some people say, "Oh, it's all about money and they're doing it as a business and it's all about profit and loss." Well, they, that is, is so not true. I mean, they they not are true. crying. I mean, there's people that are you know when something happens to a horse, they are crying. I mean, Barbaro, which was a very famous mm. horse in America that mm -hmm. ended up breaking a leg, and right. they just spent millions and days if not months of rehab trying to yeah. have this horse survive i mean this was not something that was yeah. making them money at the end of the day they did yeah. it because they love that horse yeah and i think you know maybe there is somebody that couldn't care less what happens to the horse at the end of the day but yeah. i would say in general most of these places the, the horses are treated yeah. like gold yeah absolutely so you don't feel like you're supporting animal cruelty by going to no i don't think races. it's any any more cruel going to a horse race and how they train a horse than it would mm. be to say train an Olympic athlete. Mm. They probably go through hell I agree. and pain and all the rest of it I too. I agree. But then the argument, like being David devil's advocate, the argument is the um, Olympic athlete does it to himself, to herself. They know what they're doing. They consciously and the poor horsey doesn't. Well, yeah. some horses just say I'm not running and they don't. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that lady from the question center told me. Like, like good luck forcing horse to do something yeah. a horse doesn't want to do. Yeah. Like, good luck with that. Yeah, if he doesn't want to do it, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, and I agree, you know, I, I'm just kind of bringing that point because it, it struck me, like, especially coming from the person who worked with horses for many years, um, I, I don't I don't feel that, you know. Obviously, like you said, there are people who might be mistreating horse, but it's like with everything, right? Most of the people love their dogs. But then there are people who mistreat their dogs, like a, like a photo, like you showed me earlier yeah, before early we started recording. Yeah, that lady in the newspaper today. Right, right. So, uh, okay. Could you tell our listeners the story about the Buddha? You told me a story about the Buddha. Did you remember on the on the Ivra uh, learning landscapes? Oh my gosh, I can't remember. Yeah, the story it was, like, about a, the it was like a, with a lady who passed out, and there was like a Buddha. So, the, so I I give a like an introduction. So I give a story about the Buddha, right? uh, or maybe an observation. Um, back in the years, my boss, right, he was um, one of the people who worked in the company, like my my colleague. Only, only he was much older. He he was like a full blown Buddhist with you know meditation mm -hmm. and all that and it, it was like many many years it, was, it wasn't like a guy who wrote the book and re read the book and it's like oh you know and uh and he got the and that was around the time when i also uh, read the book called uh buddhist book of life and death mm -hmm. i think and um 
And it was surprising how many things were kind of like adding up one to another. And um, and what that my, my boss observed is like he got like a little statue of Buddha. Like years, years ago when he was in Thailand. And among all the houses that he changed from one house to another house to all these things, somehow that thing was still somewhere with him. It just, it just like refused to be lost. And I kind of have the same observation that like you have this like a little Buddha head or Buddha statue that they're just, just always around. No matter what you do, they're kind of keep being there. And then you must want it there. Yeah, I don't know. Not consciously. Like something is happening. They're always kind of kind of stick around. And uh, and in a, in a house where I'm where I'm living right now, there is like a Buddha in a in a in a garden. But it's not your Buddha. It's just one that was already there. Yeah. Ah, it, interesting. It, yeah, it was already there, but it just kind of sticks there. All the all the you know storms, winter storms, and all that so is there. So it's on the, it's on my Instagram. You 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 spot it. It's like yeah. rem, you know remind me. Yeah, if I do stuff. have a Buddha that I carried back in my backpack from Nepal in 1982. Wow, right, right. Yeah. Right. Is it the only, only Buddha? It's a wooden Buddha. Yeah. And, of course, there's sort of the Chinese-looking Buddhas and mm-hmm. the different Buddhas, but this one is an oh. Indian Buddha. Do you know Do you know these all these distinctions in Chinese? I know Buddhism? there's a different way, like if one hand's up and the other's on the lap, it, it's a certain kind, but I don't know all the right. distinctions. Right, But right, I do right. have that Buddha in my... Uh, in my house in Waterville. Right. I got, I was, I was going to ask you about you. You tweeted a number of times about the storytelling contest in mm-hmm. Killarney. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit? But because the podcast is all about, all about mean, telling stories. You mean in Sneem? In Sneem. Is it in Sneem? The Sneem Storytelling Festival. Okay. Yes. Please. please. Can, oh. you, can you lay it out for so our listeners? I believe this was the seventh annual Sneem Storytelling Festival. Last. But got two weeks ago, I guess it is, every November, first weekend in November. It's a three-day festival. It's fantastic. It's, uh, there I am using that word again. It is, it was started by a man named Bat Burns, mm. who grew up in Sneem, was a teacher, mm-hmm. then went to the States, was a teacher there. Now he's retired, and he does tours around Ireland, storytelling related. He is a master storyteller. Mm. And he wanted to bring an event to Sneem that would bring business off season. Because let's face it, the Ring of Kerry, it's a mm. summer tourist destination for mm. m- most, most people. Mm. And he started the Sneem Storytelling Fest. Now they had storytellers from, let's see, in the last couple of years, it's been New Zealand, wow. United States, um, Australia. Are they like true stories or are they made up? Some of the people are doing true stories. There was a wonderful young man from Northern Ireland who came down, and I'm afraid I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but his stories in rhyme Mm. were about his family vacation when he was a kid. Wow. I mean, that was impressive. He, He told a story that lasted about six minutes about driving in the car on family vacations with his parents and the whole thing rhymed. Wow. But they do open kind of like an open mic, but it's not really an open mic because Mm -hmm. you're in a pub. Yeah. And so they have pub swap, story swaps and that. So they have organized stuff. They have a play one night. They do... And what's the crawls. limit on the story? Like, uh, I mean, time limit. Is it a time limit? Is it like six minutes? Well, there long? isn't technically a climb, time limit, when, but when people like start going, uh, like, you know, and jiggling around their yeah. cups and, you know, they kind of give you the hint that it's time it's, to like, go. It's, it's too long. <laughs> okay, okay. So you don't have like a bloke who rolls in and like talks for three hours. Well, straight. no, not three hours. <laughs> they did have someone that went a little long, but uh, <laughs> but I don't think that's ever going to happen again. <laughs> okay, okay. That's good. It 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 looks it looks great. Like you know what what you said. I, they I have don't a know. kids section where there's the couple storytellers oh. that are really geared towards children, okay. and they go into. But the, the stories, like made up stories, are allowed too. Oh yeah, they have some of them are you know old Irish fairy tales. Some of them. Oh, are okay, straight things up, that you make up. You know everything. Goblins and yeah, stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Oh wow. Banshees in the woods. <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> that's, Selkies. That's 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 that's, that's great. And, and you're telling story yourself there. I have told a few, yep. I've oh. taken some classes. Bab Burns actually does uh-huh. storytelling workshops throughout the year and helps you learn how to craft a story. Wow. 
That's great. Yep. That's great. And he's actually passing the mantle on to his son. Because mm-hmm. um, Bat wears a hat that his grandfather wore. And I'd say Bat, I don't even know, I'm terrible with age, but I'd say he's mm-hmm. like 70. And his grandfather was a storyteller before him. So he mm-hmm. wears his grandfather's hat. And now this year, he passed that hat on to his son. So now his son ran one of the pub storytelling sessions with his great great grandfather's wow. hat. That's great, you know, and I, and I totally get the idea to do something off, of outside of the season. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember uh, there is a village in, in County Clare called Cariga Holt. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are pubs and everything. And, and, you know, our friend lives there and he runs the charter boat. So uh, just, uh, you know, a few years back when I was, you know, just crazy shark fishing, I was there all the time during the season. There was like plenty of people and everything like and um so yeah great the, this is a village and then we we went for like winter fishing in winter right and so i drove down like a day before because my other friend has a house there so you know i said the house and uh, oh let's go to the pub right and we walking and like the okay, streets are empty right and we walk into that pub and in the pub is like you know that skipper and his wife my friend myself pub owner and the priest right and it's like this is probably all the people who are in Kariga Hall right now. <laughs> this sounds like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. But it was like, you know, it, it occurred to me like how seasonal that whole thing is. There's like a handful of people in the in the village. And the moment you don't have tourists, you don't have people who are going fishing or angling, you don't have all these things. It's like well, just, just, you know, a couple of farmers and the like, priests. It. Like, it's, it's, so just it. think if they brought in a store, like a even a fishing festival. Hmm. Or something yeah. like that, that you don't actually have to learn fishing. You know, you don't have to actually be fishing. fishing you can just, fishing it can be story education. Te- fishing storytelling. Yeah. I'm telling you, it That's was it. this big. Shanty, <laughs> what do they call them? Sea shanties, you know, or yeah. whatever, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, anything like that. There's actually a great festival in February oh. in Waterville and Balanskelegs and Car Daniel. Mm. That's St. Bridget's festival weekend. And it's in Irish. It's three-day festival. It has stories and music and cultural lectures and everything. Everything's in Irish. Oh. But they have live simulcast for people like me who mm. don't speak Irish. Uh, it, was my, it was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just, I was no, just, was just going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> we wear headphones and somebody's actually translating throughout the entire thing. Oh, stop. Hello? Hello. Yeah. I think you need to close, make it closer to your, to your move it closer to your face. Yeah. Like now? Yeah. Maybe. Better? Yeah, I can see the recording here going on. Yeah, just okay. But yeah, so they have live. They have a woman in the back of the room, and mm-hmm. she's doing translations of the entire festival, wow. and so you learn all kinds of things. Right, right. Because sometimes, of course, when someone speaks with their carry accent, they are speaking English, but I still feel like they might be speaking Irish. What do you? What's your take? <laughs> what's your? What's it right now? Like two foreign national for two foreign nationals, right? Not not really like two foreign nationals with Irish passports. These accents, like I, I it's, this, this is like I felt really proud of myself when I was walking down the pier and I heard like one fisherman saying something to another fisherman, like not anglers, like a fisherman. And uh, and I understood what he said, <laughs> and, but I knew it was like, it takes time to actually understand what is he saying. And then I'm working with a with an English lady. She's in Ireland for many many years, and she said that her neighbor speaks with such a heavy carry accent, like nobody can understand him. And she asked his family once, like, how do you, how do you understand him? How do you even like, and they said like, well, we just understand like half of what he says. <laughs> well, that's like one time I was sitting in a pub waiting for a friend and they came in and I said, hey, look, those guys over there are speaking Irish at the bar. And she listened for a minute and she said, no, they're not. And I said, yeah, yeah, they're speaking Irish. <laughs> and she said, no, they're not. They're just talking with really heavy carry accents. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I couldn't see, I couldn't understand a word that I have said. A, I have a story like that myself. It was uh, maybe a week number five that I was in Ireland, right? So very, everything very new. But obviously I went out fishing. 
and I'm packing my rod and I'm coming back and a, and a, and a guy stops in a car and he says something to me. Like, some, it sounded like, Anina, Anina. So I said, sorry, could you repeat? Like three times. And I was just, I was just about to say to him, speak in English because, <laughs> because I was convinced that he's, he's speaking in, in, in Irish. But luckily he said like, any fish. <laughs> Couple of months later, I figure out that he was asking any luck, <laughs> but I was like, I completely so. I was like, yeah, it would be it would be quite funny if I ask him to speak English to me when he was also. <laughs> well, I picked up a hitchhiker today, and uh, it's not the first time I've picked up this gentleman, older man hmm. who lives in South Kerry, hmm. and I think I can understand a quarter. Yeah. Of what he says. <laughs> And all of that, you just smiling and nodding. So it's and like nodding. that 10 miles when I pick him up and give him a lift into Kersavine. Yeah. I just think, okay. And we're he's not talking get all much. the time. Is he talking all no, the time? No, not all the time, but we, we try to have a bit of a conversation. Right. And Is he aware that you only only kind of understand the quote? Oh, I think so, because I'll say, what was that? You know, I think I think all the all the people in South Gary, they all kind of understand aware. that I'm not getting 100 percent of it <laughs> yeah maybe they just aware that 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 some people not getting 100 percent of that then just getting live. then they it. tell me i talk really fast and they can't understand <laughs> me so i was like oh, not the first time i've heard that <laughs> oh and speaking about the hitchhikers are you are you still part of the of the um, couch it? surfing couch, couch surfing i am and then there's another one that is called warm showers hot showers oh. Warm showers. Warm showers. Yep. It's for cyclists. It's for a, cyclists, yep. Right. A free place to stay, a free shower, anything like that to right. someone that's into cycle touring. And there's a, is, is there an interest in that? Is there? Is there do you have many people? Oh, yeah. And and actually, there's programs. some. There's another group that someone was telling me about that's uh, for people that drive. I can't think of what the word for it here is. We call them RVs, recreational vehicles. But yeah, someone yeah, that yeah. rents, you know, like a trailer home kind of thing and yeah, yeah. travels around that they're there's, quite cheap to get it's, yeah there's it's, websites it's, here for people yeah, that are yeah, you know it, that who has a driveway that's welcoming yeah it's like 100 and, euro a, a weekend you can you can bring it out and just just go but cheap to you might not be cheap to everybody yeah oh but i mean like if you're if you're talking about like a big oh, yeah. machine in which you can actually and there's a live kitchen. Yeah. And yeah, and all the rest of it. So, you know, it's, but it's, che it's cheaper than renting a car. And there's actually somebody that, I mean, a big company from the looks of it, that rents little vans hmm. that don't have the shower and the kitchen and all that. It really just is like a bed. And, and huh. the people that stay in those, they stay somewhere near like public toilets and showers and the right. campgrounds or something. And a couple times I've come back home and my husband will say, oh, there's two French people upstairs are taking showers. And they might have stopped him and said, you know, hey, where's a good place where we can take a shower? Is there a campground? And he'll say, you can oh. take a shower at our house. Right, right. So, so is it like people just showing up one day in front of your door saying, ding, ding, hello? Well, the new house, when you're coming up along the Cary Way mm. into Waterville, you actually will walk right in front of the door right. of my house. Right. But so do, do you sure. have like a big sign and an and arrow saying, Show, free shower here? <laughs> no, but it turns out the house that I have just bought has believe it or not, an outdoor shower in a shed. That's awesome. On the pro property, hot water shower. So that's not awesome. quite sure why that's there. I don't know if the previous owners were farmers or something. Yeah. But uh, sure enough, if somebody was, that's you know, camping awesome. or something like that and didn't. Yeah. I mean, they could pitch the tent in my yard and use the hot shower, right. which I'd be right. glad to let them do. Right. So the so the couch surfing is just people who want who wants to okay, Stay. see the area. Right, and exactly. Couch surfing is I a remember, like, organization where on the, on the, on the, on the previous free. podcast you said it's it's not like it's a it's free accommodation. It's it's free. Right. It's free accommodation, but it's not like a free hotel. You yeah. I have a two night minimum mm -hmm. because I want people to see the area. Yeah. So originally it was started for like minded travelers to really bond and show their uh, own community. Okay. And then it evolved into kind of like a, yeah, I'm someone, just around and, you know. Well, someone who has a big following on social media basically said, hey, this is a free way to travel. Hmm. And that's not what it was designed for. It uh -huh. was designed for community, not just a free place to travel. So uh -huh. I actually have a two-night minimum to prevent, you know, the people that come in at 10 p.m. and leave at 7 in the morning. Right. It's not what I'm interested in. Yeah. Mine's yeah. not a free hotel. Mine is a place where they can come stay for free and mm. enjoy Waterville. So you're area. so you just want to show the beauty of the area exactly. to people. And all that for the 
just the benefit of the community. Yeah, I just, it's that's that very, beautiful. That's very commendable. That's, I mean, people have hosted me all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I through uh, the couch surfing. Well, thing. even before that, when I uh, when I was young, I was actually hiking through Nepal, which is a whole other story. But I was hiking in Nepal and with a group, and I got sick. I just mm. I don't know if I ate something, but I got really sick. And the family that was living on the side of this mountain just let us stay in the house for two and a half days while I was sick as a dog mm. and wouldn't take any money, wouldn't take anything um, after we were there for two nights and off we went. So, you know, there's wonderful, generous people in the world. So yeah. I believe in good karma. I'll be generous too. Yes. Yes. You you said that even when I, when I said one day on the Twitter that all these podcasts and all that is, is, is you know, thanks to you. I said like, <laughs> you've just, yeah, no, no doubt. No That's doubt. It, I'm building you, karma. You build, you're building a boatloads of good <laughs> karma. That's, that's for sure. That's for sure. I got to ask you about one thing that, that I'm, I'm wondering about. You're from Texas. Texas. So obviously you grew around hunting. Well, I actually grew up in Maryland, oh. which is big into hunting. Yeah, yes. where and, and it's Dude. interesting because the hunting in Texas is different than the hunting in Maryland. Of course. My friends that hunted in Maryland would go out and trek through the woods and track the deer and follow it mm -hmm. and hunt it. Yeah. It was, it's, in white, Texas, it's white tail, right? In, right, in exactly. Maryland. Okay. In Texas, they put corn out. <laughs> with a corn feeder for like a week ahead of time. And then they go out there on a weekend and the deer come for the corn and they shoot it. And I'm like, okay, that's not hunting. Yeah. But that's just that's my a harvest. personal opinion. Yeah. But yeah, hunting. And, and then also in Texas, the deer were, were about the size of a big German shepherd, if you ask me. They were the smallest deer. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's in a drought, let's face it. There's mm. not a lot of grass. So yeah. they just aren't fed like the, yeah. the deer in maryland and pennsylvania yeah. were huge there's a big problem with hogs in texas uh, yeah feral hogs the yeah. wild ones they're terrible yeah so how they're long gigantic. is it going like it's it's going on for like years and years and yeah as a matter of fact I, um, a man i knew in in austin texas was driving to houston and hit a feral hog on the road hmm. and uh and it killed and he was killed the, oh, I mean, some of the, yeah, the, some of the oh. hogs were, you know, they're hundreds of pounds. Yeah. There was actually the news one time on one of the roads in Texas, there's a new highway that goes around Austin mm -hmm. to San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, the speed limit's either 80 miles an hour or 90. I mean, it's some ridiculously fast speed mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. And one time a giant feral hog got onto the road. So they had like news helicopters and oh. everybody's showing it because this... You know, it was as big as like, <laughs> it mm. was as big as a bicycle mm. and it was just walking. So they just were like making sure nobody drove 80 miles an hour because yeah. somebody would have killed themselves hitting that yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard that. So, so overall, you don't have a problem with hunting. As no, a, I think, I mean, I have, I had friends back in Texas that would go to Africa and hunt and they wouldn't yeah. eat anything. They just wanted that thing hanging on their wall. Right. I'm not too fond of that as yeah. a yeah. institution, but, uh, but I grew up with friends who, you yeah. know, they hunted and we had the deer and the goose and everything else for dinner. Right. You know, on exactly. a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Exactly. So that's interesting. I'm I'm asking because uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I'm trying to do with podcast is change a little bit acceptance and mm -hmm. perception of hunting. Because I think there's a lot of mis misconception and uh you know, surprisingly a lot of people who work in with animal conservation and animal welfare and uh, research kind of thing, they, they actually appreciate to some extent hunting and hunters as the people who are, you know, on the ground, and know what's up and can get it. But then there is another whole, another, you know, host of people who are just... I had a guy who refused to come on the podcast. He's supposed to be on the podcast. And we all agreed everything and all that. And then I was going to Dublin to meet him and he says, you know what? I look at your podcast and I don't support hunting. So it would be for me morally wrong to be on your podcast. And I was like, instead what? of taking it as an opportunity to talk on your podcast well, exactly. about how he doesn't like, well, hunting. exactly. <laughs> this, this, that was, that was exactly my response. I say like, look, I don't want to say his name and say like, look, that's a, that's, a, that's, that's an opportunity. That's a platform for you. And I, that, that makes me want to talk to you even more Never mind the thing that you want to talk to me because it wasn't like, you know, like nothing like, you know, 
groundbreaking or anything, but like, let's talk about this. Um, but he never, like, he was just. Well, that's interesting. I was talking to some fishermen recently, and I can't remember if it was a lake here in Killarney, hmm. but they were saying that some people feel like everything's getting, the perception is, is that all the fish are being killed yeah. that are caught in the lake in Killarney. And the reality is that's not true. Yeah. They're not getting killed. They're, you know, some of them are going home and being someone's dinner. Is it, is it like trout fishery? But yeah, and that kind of thing. And some of them are being released back. And, mm -hmm. But you know what? Nobody's taken video yeah. of the one that gets released and swims back away. And so that's people are true. seeing the that's photograph the of the guy say that holding they, the dead one, and that's it. That's true. But they holding sometimes they're holding the li live life one. I would like, I think that there is a big angling com community that is into catch and release. Which sometimes is, you know, goes the other way because because actually there is a mortality rate on those released fish as well. Oh yeah, the stress of being. I hot. have a I have a blog actually on my on my website called called Catch and Release, where I'm where I'm dealing with that. That you know, it's strange that you have a, some types of fishing, and it, you know, so so fishing started as a way of sourcing food. Sure. Right. Yeah. And it kind of was change in the way that fishing for some fish in some ways feels unacceptable right you you you're fishing for a trout you only can fish with a fly fishing gear and you cannot do this and you cannot do that and it's like like how you know how did that happen like it kind of got twisted and, and bent then like to well, that's interesting yeah. well i have a friend that's a fishing guide down in key west florida wow and he does but he's with they're on I, they're on the flats, which is a part <sighs> that's all really really shallow water, and they go on these that's really my flat that's, bottom. That's boats. my bucket list fishing right but, there. But uh, but he won't take anyone out if they want to take the fish home. Yeah, all the fish. Yeah, is fish and release. Yeah, because it's for the. Is it the law like that? No, no, he just doesn't. He just, he just, yeah, that's he for just, him personally. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. thinks you know it's a sport. It's something that he likes to do, but he doesn't believe in just killing the fish randomly. Especially, yeah. for one thing, most of the people that would go down there with him would be tourists. Yeah. You know, they're not taking home a 12-pound fish Yeah, on the yeah. plane. Yeah, exactly. So he just says no. Yeah, yeah. No killing Well, I get, I get it. There's a there's a lot of people that I wonder what this uh, law, because there's like, to me, it's always, you know, the always qu first question is the conservation status. Is it enough of this? Is it enough? Well, speaking of that, let's yeah. talk about your shark fishing. Yes. What about it? Because my understanding was that sharks are being overfished. Yes. So do you throw them back when Ter you... Terribly. So so first of all, I, I haven't been shark fishing for like three or four years. Mm -hmm. um, they're terribly overfished. And and uh, there's no limits. They're commercially exploited. Uh, there are some endangered species. There's yeah, there was a boat that was just uh, snagged off the coast of Ireland. Yeah. Was it about two months ago that had thousands yeah, it's of shark it's, fins it's, it's, happen, it's happening and that means all, the all those sharks are dead it's happening at the all, of the sea. it's happening all the time and not only sharks there's other species of fish which are com commercially exploited and then critically endangered um and that's not even what was that the red garnered i think this is the latest one so that's not even that's not even economy of extinction because like with bluefin tuna you have this thing called economy of extinction that the you know major like a especially in Japan, they want the fish extinct because they're sitting on the mountain of the frozen bluefin tuna. So then they, they, a pound will be, you know, worth, worth more than a pound of gold if the fish is extinct for the, you know, top top shelf, high level sushi. That's right? crazy. So that's called the economy of extinction. But in case of fish like Great Garner or something like that, it, that just, uh, what's the word, ignorance. It's just it's a critically endangered species, you know, you're fishing. Otherwise, how can you be selective if you if you're fishing with these big right? But not that I'm not trying to answer a question. Like all the I, I haven't took a single shark. All the sharks were measured fork length until the fork of the uh tail fin, full length to the full end of the fin and girth was tagged with a tag with a number. And uh that data was sent to fishery board. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, so they were all released. Yes, they all yeah. released, and there was all a part of the shark tagging program. Not that I was doing that to you know help in t shark tagging; it was fun. But uh, you know, I even said to ones that uh, I would rather eat my shoes than that shark, right? Which you know now when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking like mm, 
I could have actually taken one. <laughs> well, I, I will admit I have eaten shark in my day. Yeah. Shark curry in Sri Lanka. Yeah. But I would, uh, I, I would you but know. But I wouldn't eat it now. Yeah, yeah. It's a, now it's, that I it, know what I know. It's a very it's a very complex subject, you know. It's a very complex subject and I and I always think like what's the conservation status? What's the impact that uh, you know the other thing that just, just drives me nuts is that when the recreational anglers are putting in one bucket into with a commercial fisherman, you know, it's like yeah, okay, exactly. like, let's 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 like like you know, someone like that's a, getting a thousand pounds that day versus yeah, one that's getting yeah, two fish. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so that's interesting. But uh, you know, well, one shout out about sharks that I think's hmm. interesting for some of the people listening that might hmm. not know about it. Have you, do you know about O C E A R C H? No. O-C- I don't know how to pronounce it. I say OC Search, but yeah. this is an organization that tags sharks. Wow. And they were the first ones to tag a great white. Mm. And they get pings back on. Oh, they're tagging them they're with, tagging with them the and, satellite. Yeah, uh, and naming them. Wow. And so that you can go onto their website and search specific wow. fish and things like that. And they sort of became famous in America because. He was getting a ping, and one of the pings came, and it said that the great white shark that mm-hmm. they had tagged off the coast of, I think, Cape Cod, mm. was down in Jacksonville Beach in the surf. Mm. So he was in Las Vegas or something, and he got mm. this ping. So he called the police department in mm. Jacksonville mm-hmm. and said, okay, this is who I am, mm. and there's this like 16-foot great white shark, and it's in the surf <laughs> at Jacksonville Beach. So somehow CNN picked it up, and they have video of him tagging the fish, and now you can. I've seen their ship in Key West. It's oh. really cool, and they just go around studying sharks. And they were, right. they were, they were the ones that tagged that shark that came tried to come across to Ireland mm-hmm. about two years ago. I think it was two summers. There was a one yeah. coming across that they thought Great might white. have been. Uh, I can't remember. I think it was that was they believed was pregnant. So there mm. was a theory that there was some oh, kind of I a remember that. fishery. I remember that or hatchery. I guess is the word somewhere near here. And yeah. So it was a really fascinating organization, Just, but you can pick one and follow it by name and see where they yeah. are. And I read a I read a book, uh, r- uh, wrote by uh, I I'm gonna I don't remember his name uh, no Pierce Pierce something, the guy who started Shark Trust. Ah, oh. and uh, there is there is no reliable witness and and observations of a great white in British waters. But there is no reason why they shouldn't be here. There's absolutely no reason. They have food, they have the right temperature, they have everything right. I always thought it was because it was too cold. No, no. It's everything is like... Don't keep telling me that. This is why I don't... (laughs) There's no reason, So, but there is not a single trustworthy, you know, report citing that would say like, yep, that was great white. No, well, none. It, it's interesting because uh, I was volunteering at swimming lessons in Karasavine a couple of weeks ago and this little girl who looked like she was about seven, hmm. you know, I asked her where she swam in the summer and she swam in Balanced Skelligs. And I said, oh, which do you like better, swimming in Balanced Skelligs mm-hmm. or swimming here in the pool? And she said, ooh, the pool. I said, why is that? She goes, ooh, sharks. Hmm. And I said, are there sharks in Balanced Skelligs? She says, I'm sure there are. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm sure there's not. <laughs> She's right. They are. There are. Maybe not that close to the shore, right? Uh, the only sharks that were coming close to the shore were uh, poor beagle sharks. Mm-hmm. But these are the ones that are critically endangered. So. so did you see about the the babies that they just found off the coast of Ireland? The babies. It, babies. Babies. Baby sharks about two weeks ago, if not even maybe a week oh, ago no. in the newspaper. No, no. They found some nesting area that wow. or hatchery area that yeah. all these egg cases are all over the all right the, egg, down egg in cases. the yeah and there's all these sharks swimming, and they think it's like a nursery oh there's plenty of nurseries yeah so, so they had great video of it and everything the yeah. other day so on the sharks like i'm a member of shark trust for mm-hmm. like 10 years and they have a program like on their on their website sharktrust.co.uk they have a sightings database where you can you know, basically, said, I saw that shark, whatever. And they have this thing called Greg Egg Case sh- uh, Hunt. Right. Where, where people are picking up the right. egg cases. And, and registering them. And they're registering and saying, okay, and so on and so on. And actually, Ellie told me that Sea Synergy does a similar thing. That's or maybe right. not Sea Synergy, but something in Ireland, there mm-hmm. is an organization that does the same thing. Yep. 
And there's lots of those. So you can contribute to, to, to two places at one time. Just go yeah. out there. And we used to do that. We would go out after the, you know, people usually picking like three of those or four and just registering. And we were doing like a full blowout whole day. And we were like ending up with like with hundreds of them on the floor and then photographing and all that. So uh, I actually must do it again. Well, Sea Synergy actually, speaking of them, they actually have internships in the summer. Yeah. And one of the things they do is they do the shark egg case counts and they mm. do seal counts and all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. They're they're amazing organizations. Yeah. There's there's a lot there's a, there's a great activities going on and like I like what they do because it's education and kind of raising awareness through education. And they also have something that they just started recently. They have stand up paddle and kayaking yeah. in La Caron there in Waterville. So you can actually go stand up paddling in the lake and right. go out to Church Island, which is a I think a sixth century monastery ruin. I mean it's Sea Synergy's doing some really cool things down there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Listen, um so we can talk for hours. We can we can talk for hours. <laughs> absolutely. Do you have any uh, any final thoughts for our listeners? Keeping in mind that this is Christmas special episode. Christmas special. So, you know, within the week from that podcast, everybody will be, you know. Well, yeah, I guess, you know, speaking of Christmas, if you want to be that kind of <laughs> mode in your brain, gift certificates, see Synergy. You know, give a gift certificate. Are we giving a good, good old you plug know, for see Synergy? Well, yeah, well, I mean, not just them, but give a gift certificate to see Synergy where someone can go out mm. and do a beach walk or exploration because they do that in the summertime or... Um, Atlantic Irish seaweed. There's a man down in hmm. Derry Nan who does seaweed walks. I've done them. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. He was that the guy who was, edible. who was who was showing like you can eat the starfish? Yeah, not starfish, but the uh, jellyfish. That's the one. That's the one. John Fitzgerald. Jeez, yeah, I was I was so bummed that I didn't pick up that workshop. Oh yeah, you weren't there. I was. Oh, that's right. He there was a I was there was a jellyfish on the beach. He picked it up, yeah. sliced it with his knife into little pieces, and handed it out. And yeah. it tasted like the ocean. Yeah, I would imagine. It was. I was really, so bummed when the, when almost when like somebody, a potato chip that yeah, was jelly. Somebody told me that that I that I that he get them to eat the jellyfish. Yep. I was so so bummed. I so wanted to. Do you think I can just and go and pick the random jellyfish and try to eat it? You could take that chance. All right. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Susan, thank you very much. All right. Happy Tommy, Christmas. always good. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Christmas to you. Oh, another thing about Waterville and all over Ireland, speaking of nature and all the rest of the stuff, you can pretty much go for a swim on Christmas Day all over Ireland, raising money for cancer charities. Yeah. So if you feel like you want to be an outdoorsy person yeah. and brag to all your friends that don't have the guts to do it, yeah. go jump in the sea. Yeah. It's like infinite. It's, it's all also over. like a, yeah. all over. Oh, is it like all over? Oh, all over. Galway, right. Dublin, wow. Phoenix, Waterville, wow. Balance Galaxy. Yeah. Are you yep. are you going? I did it last year. Right. I can't believe how cold that water felt <laughs> <laughs> on my shins. It was like my shins hurt. Right. Because you think you can just jump in. Mm. It's not like Galway where they jump off this edge of this thing into the water. We have to like run. Into. Because it's really kind of shallow, it gets yeah. a little deeper and a little. So you're running way out there in, to get into the deep water, and I your don't know feet what's are worse, numb, actually. and then your shins are numb, and then your knees are numb. <laughs> I don't know what's worse, you know. May, maybe you got you have an opportunity to kind of get you know get yourself used to the temperature, and you always you always have an option to turn back. But my friend told me they uh, in in Castle Gregory. They jumped into the water, and he was very sorry. He was good. I couldn't, I couldn't I get like, quick enough out of the water. You think you're going to have a heart attack. Because eventually, if you're in there long enough, you just go numb. It doesn't feel cold anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, so then, thank you. Tommy, it was fun as always. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. -bye.